Well, hey, we're going to talk today about why y'all are in church, why we're a community, why we're a family, why, you're, why you got saved. How, how many like to know why you got saved? I mean, right? I mean, there, the rest of you just don't care who, about why you got saved. Everybody know what I mean by salvation? What I mean by this is salvation is this. Is at some point, somewhere along the way, um, somebody messed up. And a long time ago, somebody messed up by the name of Adam. Adam messed up and allowed this stupid thing called sin to come into the earth. And when sin came into the earth, it started to make us get old. How many are glad you should get old? Man, I, right, nobody raised their hand, right? Sin came in, decay came in, destruction came in. We had to work hard. The babies got born. They were a lot harder to be born instead of just like, whoop, there it is. You know, it's just everything got hard because of sin. But the biggest thing about sin when sin came into the earth was the fact that it separated us from God. And you know what? We're his kids. And I don't know about you, but I'm tired of seeing God's creation being separated from him and from his purposes and from his intent. And so we just need as the church to get this message that says, listen, Jesus has paid the price of redemption. He bought us back. I mean, we belong to him to begin with, but he bought us back so that we could have relationship. We could get to know God. Not just go to church and like see somebody else know God, but we would actually be able to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And our purpose in that salvation is this, is so that all of the world will know the glory or the goodness of our God. That's the reason. So I just want to just put some things at rest today. I want to challenge you on some things. How many believe that Jesus died for you? How many are glad for that, right? How many believe that God loves you so very much? Man, I'm just glad for that too. Aren't you glad that God loves you? Aren't you glad that God loves you in spite of how ugly you are? In spite of how old you are, how fat you are, how inadequate you are, how mean you can be sometimes, how judgmental you can be sometimes, even in all of our mistakes, all of our errors, all of our misguidings, all of our bad choices, God still loves us so much. That's some good news. Isn't that good news? I'm just really glad that God just loves me in spite of me. So when he saved me, he saved me from me. That was a good thing. That was a good day. Everybody said amen. amen. Shut up. Why did you say that? So... So he wants to restore this relationship and he wants to bring salvation to us. But I want to tell you something. I want to challenge you today that Christianity and the intent and the reason that God loves us is for his ultimate glory. Anybody have a problem with God getting all the glory? I mean, he's God. Don't you think God should get all the glory? I mean, if the glory starts moving to us, then we're taking the place of God. And in the word, that means that that's an idol. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be an idol. I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to stand in the way of God getting glory. I don't, want, I, don't want to be, I don't want to be made much of. I want him to be made much of. With everything that I do, with everything that I say, with everything that I give, with everything I'm a part of, I want all of the things to be pointed to him. I was listening to Bill Johnson on uh, Friday night and a statement that he said, I, I just want to throw this out. I want to just propose this to you. I'm, be I'm believing that in these last days, no matter if the um, economy is going into the tanker or the fact that we're downgraded in our credit rating, um, God's still in control. And I'm really, really glad about that. But I want to tell you something that there is in, all, in the midst of all of this chaos and craziness and devastation and all the potential for failures in the world that there is still a major, major move of God and a major, major revival that is ready to spread across our land. And God wants to come and redeem and call back a whole generation of people that are willing to run with him. Now, I don't know about you, but you know, some of us are struggling with walking with God. Some of us are struggling with talking with God. But I think God's calling us up that, listen, come on, guys, let's run together. Let's run this race Amen. together. And with us, it's impossible. But with God, it is absolutely, absolutely, absolutely possible.
So I'm excited about all the good things that are coming and the revival that's going to take place. But I want to tell you how it begins. It begins by allowing the culture that we live in to change. Now, I'm not talking about you moving geographically. I'm not talking about you getting better financially. I'm talking about a spiritual environment, an environment that hovers around you that is conducive to all that God has in heaven to come down to earth. How, how many like to taste a little bit of heaven? I mean, I've seen, I've seen like grocery stores and restaurants say, a taste of heaven, just a taste of heaven, and it happens to be cheesecake, you know? Okay, well, that's cool. But how many would like to really actually experience, maybe for the first time, God's love? and God's joy, and God's contentment, and God's peace, and having a peace that actually passes your understanding. See, these are things, I mean, I don't know about you, but there's been crises in my life when man hasn't had the answer, and I've needed God to be the answer, and I'm so glad that God is the ultimate answer. Thank you, Jesus. That's good preaching. That's true, good preaching. That, that should at least get one of these. Wow. All right. So why do we come to church? What's the intent? What's the purpose? Why are we saved? Why does God want us in his family? Why has God chosen us? I mean, anybody watch Kung Fu Panda Bear? I get a lot of theology out of Kung Fu Panda Bear. Let me just tell you what one of the, I guess it was the turtle. The turtle says this. There are no accidents. I believe that. I don't live my life by fate or chance. Whoops, I don't live my life by whoops. And I definitely don't come from a monkey. Amen. Elephants, there might be a possibility. But <laughs> monkeys, no chance. Careful, Jim. So if there's nothing accident or nothing by chance, then maybe you're supposed to be here today. Yes. I mean... If God is moving the chess pieces of your life around, maybe it's not an accident that you're here today to hear this. Amen. God wants to create in our culture a culture of honor. Our children don't honor their parents anymore. Our children don't honor their teachers anymore. People don't honor authority in their lives anymore. And I'm gonna give you what Bill Johnson said. I'm just gonna give it to you. This is not my words, but I believe it's the Holy Spirit's words that, that he spoke, that Bill Johnson spoke. And it happens to do with me as, as one, but for many. But for revival to come to your life, for revival to come to our church, for revival to come to our community, for revival to come to our land where things get healed and set straight, Honor has to be in the midst. Unity has to be in the midst. And he said, he said this statement. He goes, he goes, I believe that if people would just once again honor their pastors and their church, revival could take place. Now, what does that mean? I'm going to tell you right now, I know firsthand that there are no pastors that are perfect. There are no leaders that are perfect. There are no parents that are perfect. There are no police officers that are perfect. Am I right, Mark? He's a sheriff. He's a sheriff. Um, but but, but the, bottom, the bottom line is when Officer Jones pulls me over under the law, I'm getting a ticket. All right? I know him, that kind of, but under the law, because of the position that he's in, he's writing me a ticket for me speeding or whatever, whatever I've done. But the reality, the reality is, is that I may have to pay a price and all that kind of stuff, but the only way that I'm really going to learn is if I honor the man that's in authority. If I honor, I'm telling you what, kids, there's some of you that want to see your parents get saved, and the only thing that's stopping it is the fact that you don't honor your parents. Parents, there's some children that you have in your family that aren't saved, that don't know Jesus. They've rejected him because of this simple thing that you don't honor your children. They don't see a culture of honor in your conversations. They hear you discrediting people. They hear you talking about people. They hear you, and so they say, I'm just telling you, where there's no honor, there's no Jesus. Does that make sense? Yes. 
And I just believe, I believe that God is calling us to the very simple things, the very simple things where our tongues get controlled because our tongues reveal our hearts. Okay? All right? And what you want to do is you, if you can get your tongue under control, the Bible says you can get all the other aspects of your life under control if you get this under control. So, Father, I just pray over all of our people that, Father, we begin to learn what it means to speak honorably and to live honorably, that we would be on righteous ground, that, Father, that we would speak life over people rather than death, that we would be people who bless rather than curse, that we would not be found in the, in the, in the, in the group of people that are considered gossipers. God, because gossipers and adulterers and fornicators and, and, and people who do such things, the Bible says, will not inherit the kingdom of God. So, Father, we want to be found in righteous ground. Help us to love, Father, unconditionally, no matter what people say or do or how they hurt us. We can love them, Father, because we have your love, and it is possible. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so let's talk about why we're here today. A long, long time ago, back in Genesis, God had an original intent. And if you read this book from Genesis to Revelation, it doesn't change. God created us for two things. To enjoy his grace. How many are so glad for God's grace? Hallelujah. Man, right? I am so glad for God's grace that he gives me what I don't deserve and he doesn't give me what I do deserve. That's grace. Isn't that good? He gives us what we don't deserve and he doesn't give us what we do deserve. And so what we do is we learn to be, as Christians, we learn to be grace suckers. In other words, we live on grace. Every single day the Bible says, I gotta give you new grace and I gotta give you new mercies because y'all need it. Aren't you glad you wake up tomorrow and you go, oh, I got some more? I got a full tank again. I can live on this grace. I can live on this mercy. 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 Faith alive. <laughs> but I can live on God's grace and he can pour that into me. And why, let me ask you something. Why does God give you his grace? Well, you need it. So that you can give it to others. Why does he give you mercy? So that you can give it to others. Why does he love you? So that you can love others. Why does he bless you? so that you can be a blessing to others. Why does he give you gifts? For your own purpose? Or to impart them and give them and use them to do what? To empower others, right? To bring what? Ultimately, to bring glory to God. We are saved, not for ourselves, Ezekiel says, but we're saved for him. We're saved for his glory. And we all think, man, it's just, man, I got a fire escape. I'm going to heaven. I got a fire escape. Thank God I go to church. Man, I'm safe. God saves us so that we can take this salvation message to the world and ultimately see God get all the glory for it. So how's that happen? How many, how many know that Jesus Christ is more than a swear word? I and mean, there's a lot of people out there who don't think that he's anything more than a swear word. Why? Well, CNN's not talking about him as Lord. They're not learning it in school that Jesus Christ is Lord. Am I right? A lot of them aren't learning it in their families around the dinner table. A lot of them don't even have dinner tables. Parents aren't, you know, most kids won't ever have a spiritual conversation with an adult? Most kids will never have a spiritual conversation with an adult. I just, I gotta ask y'all something. When's the last time you just sat down and talked about eternal things? When's the last time you just sat down and say, here, here let me just, let me just put it this way. What if we actually, as the church, lived our lives in such a way that everything that we did brought glory to God? Well, I mean, what if there, I mean, is it possible? I mean, just, is it possible that in everything that we do that we're, we, we can bring glory to God? The answer is yes. The Bible says if you give a cup of water in the name of the Lord, there's something powerful behind that. Just a glass of water. But what if we began to attach all of our conversations to bringing glory to God? What if it, every time we gave something and was generous that it 
brought glory to God. Now let me ask you something. Is it all right for people to honor you? Is it all right? How many of you like to be honored? Oh, y'all are just lying. Right? I mean, who, don't you like to be, how many of you like to honor other folks? Right? To honor your children. I mean, just bring on, man, I just want to honor, man. I just want to honor. Thank you for, man, worshiping today, man, getting up there. Thank you for playing that guitar. Thank you for playing that. We just want to honor you. Man, I was like, every time somebody got up to speak at this conference, the place erupted, stood up and just applauded. Is that bringing glory to men? Or is that bringing glory to God? If Jesus said to give honor, right, that must be that we're able to receive honor. Right? So listen, here's how we live, here's how we live our lives. Every time, every time that somebody says thank you to you for what you're doing, they honor you, they give you something, they honor you, just, just, man, just be humble and say, man, thank you. And then in your private time, you know, your private time with the Lord, just say, Jesus, man, it's all yours. All the glory goes to you. But don't walk around in this false sense of pride or whatever that says, you know, well, no, and you know. Let me tell you, we talked about this at the table the other night. Let me tell you what humility is. Humility is not talking trash about yourself. Humility is just talking less about yourself. It's making much of God and not much of us. Because let me tell you something. Let me tell you, let me tell you, some people think that they're being humble when they talk about how bad their lives are or how bad their conditions are or how just awful things are. Instead of just, I mean, a thankful person is almost looked at as proud. And I just think that God's trying to change our thinking and the fact of, man, man, I mean, what's going to attract the world to us is how we honor each other, how we love each other, how we honor God, that, that, that we begin to see the value. I mean, when I look at little Owen, you know, I, as a, he's not here, he's back there. I'm like, dude, he disappeared. But when I, begin to, when I begin to look at that boy, see, if I see him with my eyes, I see, you know, man, he's kind of bald, you know, he's uh, got a little hair there and he's got a little white thing there and he's checking out somebody over there. I see with my natural eyes, I can just see the exterior. <laughs> you know I'm talking about you, don't you? <laughs> but, you know, but if I see with the eyes that God has given me that the Holy Spirit and how he, how Jesus sees Owen, then I can begin to see the value that God put in him and, and because I'm going to be in Owen's life for the rest of his life, I can begin to declare things over his life and call all of that gold out of his life. Well, can I tell you something? That's easy to do with a baby. But with all of us that have made failures and have made mess-ups and have screwed up and have had bad days and we've just, we just messed up, we're just messy. Yeah. It's hard sometimes to get past the messiness of people to see the gold that's inside of them. And God wants us, church, church, listen to me. God wants us to become a people that can begin to see into people's lives and begin to call the good stuff out of their lives and focus on that. And see, when Jesus looked at you and he looked at me, he didn't see who we were. He, he at that point, he saw who we were going to become. And that's the way we got to see people. That's the way we've got to see the potential in people. That's what gives us the ability to look beyond their, their failures and, their, and those things that just want to keep you from getting close. He, he, but see, love, see, love, unconditional love, sees deep into a person. God, when he judges, he doesn't judge by the outside appearance, does he? He judges by what's inside the heart. And I think us, a lot of times, man, first impressions own us. I think that God wants us to begin to have his eyes, his ears, his mouth to speak life over people. Are you a receiver or a reproducer? Are you a receiver or a reproducer? How many of you have either grown up in church 
or have at least been in church circles for more than a year? Raise your hand for more than a year. Not just this church, but any, any church throughout your life. More than a year. How, let me ask this. How many are less than a year that you've ever been in a church? Less than a year. Okay. So most of us. All right. Let me just say this and hear my heart completely on this. All of you that are in here right now should be teachers of the gospel of Jesus. Every single one of you. Am I, am I right? For those that know, am I right? Anybody, anybody agree with me on that? We all should be teachers. Let me, let, me, let me just give you this. What's more important? A call or a commandment? Call, commandment. So we got call and commandment. Good. That's good. All right. I will say this. A commandment is for all. A call is specific, but a commandment always overrules the call. Let me tell you, let me, let me, let me, when we go finish on. All right, ready for this? Uh, and and I'll mem- let me just let me say it another way. A call will not contradict a commandment. It, won't, it will complement a commandment, and it will, be, it will give you a specificity of the commandment. You maybe do it a specific way. Love. Well, brother, I'm not called to love. Oh, really? The commandment is that we love one another. Brother, I'm not called to love. What are some other commandments? Throw some out to me. To honor your parents. All right, honesty. Don't bear, don't have false witness, okay. No covenants, no idols, right? Gossip, right? Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Who's that for? Everybody except for Don and I. We don't have to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Oh, wait a minute. We're believers too. When he went away and said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Go into all the world and make disciples of every nation. How we all doing on that? Let me ask you this. How y'all doing on making disciples just of your family? How y'all doing on making a disciple just yourself? I'm going to give you just a little thing that's going to be real helpful today. When you come to church, take notes. Come to church and learn so that you can teach. If you knew that you were going to have to go out tomorrow and give the same lecture that I just gave today, I promise you, you'd be taking notes or you'd be recording it, or you would get the CD, or you'd get the DVD, or you would be recording it with your Verizon iPhone or whatever, or you'd have your iPad out and you'd be taking things down. I'm telling you right now, if we really believed what we say we believe, that we are supposed to go out there and make disciples. Pastor Scott, that seems so hard. How are we gonna go into all the world and make disciples of all nations? That seems just crazy. Well, can I just tell you how easy it is? Jesus did it. Yeah, he's the son of God. Can I ask you something? How did Jesus do it? Did Jesus do it by discipling the masses? Did Jesus do it by teaching on the Sermon on the Mount? Is that how he discipled people? Who did Jesus spend the most time with? Twelve. And one of them was Judas, who was a traitor. I'd like to pour into somebody three and a half years, be the son of God, and have them kiss you with the kiss of death. And know it. And still invest in them. Is that the right heart, do you think? Because see, God's will is that none should perish, including the Judases. 
The ones who will do you the most damage and hurt you the most. If you have the right heart for them, you will continue to pour into them in the hope that that will of theirs will turn. See, our job is not to be God and to be judge. Our job is to be his people in being used by his will into this world and that we can touch other people's lives and do his will here on the earth and to bring him glory and to do the impossible things that are impossible for us but are so possible for him and with him and when he is in us, it becomes possible for us. Let me tell you how easy it is. Ready? And bear with me on the numbers. I, it's been a while since I heard this. How many think it would be important to God that all of the world became Christians? That all the world came to know Jesus? That all the world got to know God the Father? Kind of important. Everybody agree with that? All right. How many thinks it would be important that if, or if it could be done, that we could do it in seven years? Would that, would that, would that be cool? Okay. Let me tell you let me tell you how it can be done. And it starts right here. All right, you ready? Everybody listen. If all of you today will commit to discipling one person in your lifetime, one person, and you, in, you ask them to disciple one person in their lifetime, okay? All of the world would be discipled in seven years. All right, let me just ask you this. Do you think the culture of our church would change if everybody in this room decided to disciple one person? Do you think the culture of our community would change if we all decided to disciple one person? All right, but here's what Jesus did. He said, listen, I spent three and a half years and I discipled 12. They weren't perfect. Oh, in fact, they all walked away from me when I died. When things got tough, they all just kind of bolted. But he did it, and when he left, he said, you know those same things that I taught you? You go and you teach them. What's the criteria? Be born again, fill with the Spirit of God, and teach, and disciple. Pastor Scott, I'm not trained, I didn't go to seminary, I didn't do this, I didn't do that, I didn't do that, da, da, da. Does anybody remember Acts chapter two? The Lord added to their numbers daily, they went from being 120 to 120,000 in a matter of weeks. How does that happen? Because people start doing what people are commanded to do, and when God puts something in their hands, it turns to much, and it makes much of him, and he becomes famous in the land. Do you think it's important that God be famous in our land right now? Do you think that Jesus Christ is becoming famous? I'm telling you right now, Jesus Christ is becoming famous in our land. I want to be a part of that kind of culture that says my whole life. All right, last point, five minutes. Five lows. Two fishes. Is it possible, John Harnish, with big guys like you and me, is it possible to feed 5,000 hungry men, plus their wives, plus their 1.2 children, with five loaves and two fishes? Is it possible? Yes. Good answer. <laughs> In the natural, is it possible? All right. Follow me, just real quick. I want to ask this question. Where did the miracle of feeding the 5,000 plus everybody else, which amounts to about 20,000 people, out of five loaves and two fish, where does the miracle take place? In whose hands does it take place? Jesus' hands, okay. I'm going to tell you that it doesn't. You ready? Watch, stay with me. Jesus comes, and the first thing that happens is he has a little boy. I think it's incredible that it's a little boy. That comes, and he says, Jesus, this is all I have, but all I have I give to you. Can I ask you something? Would it have been any harder for Jesus to feed 5,000 with one loaf and one fish, or five loaves and two fish, when you've got to feed 20,000 people? Would it have been any harder? He, I mean, if he's going to work a miracle, stink. He could have done it with just one loaf and one fish. Am I right? Yes. Okay. 
So the boy, in his reasoning, could have said, hey, Jesus, my mom packed me this lunch. I'm willing to share, but I think I should be able to keep a couple loaves and maybe a fish, and you can have the rest. What made it powerful was the fact that that little boy didn't come and bicker or barter with Jesus. He came, Jesus, what do you need? Whatever you need, I give it all. That began the miracle. Can I just tell you that? That began, Jesus took everything that that little boy had and he used it. Am I right? The oil, when the oil, this is all the oil I have. And this, if I give you this, I'm gonna die. Here's a little this, a little this. God takes, God takes the little in our lives, the, the, all that we've got left. He says, oh, God, I'm tired. I'm wore out. I'm struggling. Oh, I got, I got no more energy. I got no more strength. He goes, good. I give it to me. I'll take it. I'll mix it up with me and I'm gonna affect 20,000 people with your life. That's the first miracle. Here's the next one. Jesus takes it into his hands and here's the scene and if you read commentaries, you'll get this. Here's the scene, Jesus is standing there, here's his 12 disciples standing there facing him and behind them are 20,000 people put in groups of 50. God has this organizing thing going on, he's an administrator I think, you know. He kind of set the earth into order, you know, the motion, it hasn't changed. How am I glad the sun's going to come up tomorrow? It's time allocated, right? I'm glad that there's some order to God. That's another whole, yeah, it's another day. So he's there with the loaves and the fishes. Here's the 12 disciples. Now, he's got these five barley biscuits. They're not big loaves of bread, are they? We have some pictures, but they're, if you go back, they're actually about the size of a bran muffin. All right, and the fish were not these big fish. They actually were probably sardine size, little tiny little fish, okay? Because it was the boy's lunch. Do you remember that? I mean, uh, what, what mother's gonna send, hey, I will send you this two 15 pound trout. You know, eat those and you know, right? I mean, it was a boy's lunch. I mean, even at Barb Soup's on, you don't get that kind of quantity. So, all right, so, so they've got, he's got his lunch here, a couple little sardines and five little biscuits. And he brings it and Jesus says, okay, well, I got 12 disciples. Okay, here's some crumbs for you. Here's some crumbs for you, some crumbs for you. Some crumbs. And he breaks up those five little bran muffins to, to say, to give to these guys. Then he takes a little sardine-sized fish and starts, which is kind of gross, starts ripping them up and handing a little bit to each one of his disciples. Now you got the disciples looking at Jesus and he says, okay, guys, let's go. Let's go feed, let's, you know, can, can you just hear it? Bus driver, move that bus. Because the miracle's gonna unfold right in front of you, right? People are gonna be blessed. Jesus is gonna be made famous. God's gonna get the glory right now. And the disciples are going, huh? With this? With this? And they're looking at Jesus, and they're looking at the crowd, and they're looking at Jesus, and Jesus is going, come on, let's go. And it says that there were about 10 yards or 10 steps between the disciples and the crowd. Can you imagine, can you imagine what was going through these guys' mind? Are you kidding me? How many of you have had God ask you to do something great for him and then give you nothing to work with. <laughs> Pastor Scott, I want you to reach 100,000 kids. It's gonna cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I'm gonna give you nothing to begin it. I know you can get a little ticked off at God when he does that kind of stuff. You can get a little offended with God you can get a little at least challenged. What, God, you're asking me to do this and I have nothing to work with. And what he says is, trust me. Trust me. How many know that we walk by sight? What do we walk by? Faith. Close your eyes and just keep on walking, keep on walking, keep on walking. Does he ask you to do that? He says he orders the steps of us, right? Keep on walking. But what's the cool thing? He doesn't ask us to walk without holding on to his hand. 
I'm so glad that I got his hand to hold on to when I'm walking blind. See, but that's what faith demands. So here you have these men and they're, man, they could be offended. They could be like challenged. And what happens is they just become obedient. And they say, here. And as they do what? As they give it, it's multiplied. What if they would have just kept it to themselves? Would it have ever multiplied? There would have been no multiplication. God, when God partners with man, things aren't just added to you, they are multiplied to you. And that which he gives you, if you give it away, guess what happens? You get more. Am I right? Has anybody experienced this besides me? That, okay, let me just ask you something. How do you get friends? By being a friend. How do you get love? By giving love. See, God is not asking his church anymore to be a reservoir or to be a lake or as I like to say, to be a swamp. God wants his church to be a river. A river has an entrance and an exit. An entrance and an exit. So everything that we get from God, what are we supposed to do with it? Give it away. Right? It passes through our hands. I promise you, as much as you guys want Owen to just stay there for the rest of his life, there's coming a day and a time, am I right, Mom and Dad, that they become their own people, they become their own person. And what you invest in his life right now, when you send him out, that's what's gonna be the most important. Right now is the most important. Right now in your lives, what is coming into your life is gonna affect what comes out of your life. Garbage in, garbage out. God in, God out. And that's what the church is here for. Let me tell you something. You wanna go deeper with God? Start discipling people, leading people to Christ. You'll find that you will so go deeper with God. When you start pouring into somebody else as a teacher to somebody else, then all of a sudden you're going to find that your depth and your understanding, God is going to, the more that you give away, God is going to give you more. The more that you give away, God is going to give you more. God, and now, but I got to tell you something. I got to be honest with you. You can't give to somebody else what you don't have. If you're not a person of prayer, you can't teach other people how to pray. If you're not a person who gets into the Word, you can't teach other people how to get into the Word. If you don't know if, you don't know if you're saved yourself, you're certainly not going to be able to help other people get saved. Am I right? I mean, it doesn't, that, that just makes sense. So the important thing is you have a starting point. Let me tell you, God wants to take a corporate gathering of people, empower them, infuse them, and then send them out. The biggest thing, the biggest thing, the biggest thing that we can do as a church is not what happens in here, but it's what happens as a result of being in here. Am I right? We're supposed to impact the world, impact the culture. We're supposed to impact the environment that we live in. We're supposed to change all those things. With God, it's all possible. I'm telling you right now, people in your family can be saved. It's possible with God. People in your family can be healed. It's possible with God. Your marriages can be restored. The kids that have fallen away, they can come back. It's possible with God. But it all begins with us making a choice that as for me and my house, I'm going to be in the house of the Lord. I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to, I'm going to do all I can to gain everything I can from the Lord. So everything that I get from the Lord, I freely give it away to others so that I can get more to give away, get more to give away, get more to give away. And why is that? Because at the end of the day, when we all stand, that great judgment day, all the things that we have done that have eternal reward, they won't be burnt up. We'll enter into his presence. He'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. Come on in. You ran a good race. You did well. You loved people well. You, 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 you sacrificed. You risked. You loved people well. Enter into my place. Enter into my rest. Come on, let's hang out for eternity and just reign together. I don't know what, I don't know what we're going to do, but I just know it's going to be stinking sick. That's all I know. We've only had a taste here. I'm excited about what's coming.